Hey everybody, back again here, uh, putting a, together a segment for uh, YouTube and uh, Boomerosity.com from the uh, Cincinnati Guitar Festival that was held back on April 27, 2019, I was uh, fortunate to be uh, part of. And uh, this is an interview, uh, more, more or less an interview, or kind of a tribute to my good friend Gary Burbank, a Radio Hall of Fame inductee, longtime personality, uh, started out years ago when uh, he was on the radio in Louisville and uh, CKLW uh, in Detroit, was on the air for 27 years on WLW, the big one, 700 in Cincinnati, uh, retired a number of years back, but uh, just a good friend and a, a music uh, lover, uh, was a drummer a while back, got some great stories, he's got some stories he's going to tell us a little later on in the interview, but basically um, it's about Play It Forward, which is a benefit organization to help musicians that need help. Uh, somewhere along the line, and Gary will explain that a little bit more, but first I'm going to put him on doing the introduction at the uh, Madison Theater in Covington, Kentucky on April 27th, 2019. Uh, that'll be the introduction, and then we're going to have Gary talking in the motorhome. Uh, Jimmy Cuz Patterson from BoomerOdyssey.com had taken me up to uh, Cincinnati from Atlanta in his motorhome, and we spent the weekend and went to the show and did all that, and Gary came by and talked to us, and we uh, recorded some of that. So we're going to play a couple of things here. First will be the introduction, and then Gary talking, and uh, we'll have some fun. Please give it up. Hi. Hi. I'm normally taller than this. I'm having a short day. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you all for coming so much. We did this. It was uh, Larry Goshorn, myself, and uh, about... Five other guys who are all dead, and uh, I am too. And uh, <laughs> we we did this. Uh, I think it, at Fairbanks one night talking about somebody. Was, was Gosh Warren had a cold or something, and uh, I said, "Well, you need to see a doctor." And he said, "Well, I can't afford a doctor." I thought, "Man, how bad is that?" One of the best known guys around is you know can't afford a doctor. And so we started talking about maybe doing something like this. So we've been doing it. We've had some great acts coming in, and it's just been really, really a lot of fun. And uh, thank you again for coming, and we're going to have a big time tonight. Let me get us started right now. You ready for some fun? I mean, it's going to be some badass blues and whatever. And you see them on stage, and, and you think, well, man, they just got it all together. And, you know, and, and, and they've got, you know, life is good. And, but watch them when they pack up and put their, all their stuff in a beat-up old Toyota. That, that, that's a 1990 or something like that. I mean, they don't have that kind of money and there's no help at all for them. And we need local music. We, we need, yeah. you know, live music. music. And so we thought, what, what if we promote local music in a charity and then get the musicians themselves to come back us up, we have some shows, bring in people that we can, and, uh, and that's a tough thing. M most of the time you don't get a lot of help. Peter Frampton lived in Cincinnati for a while. I had a friend that lived two doors down from him. And I asked my friend, I said, can you ask Peter Frampton if he would do a show to help the local music scene? So the guy explained to him what it was about. Peter Frampton said, when and where I'm there. What a good guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he understands yeah. Yes, yeah. that there are people out there that play just as good as the guys who made it big. Yeah. But, like, they didn't get the break. They didn't get that break. They didn't get the break. And so, uh, Peter Frampton said, I'll play the show. And he came up, we made, we're still spending money from that. You know, <laughs> to help people out. <laughs> Good. He did Good. so well for us, and yeah. we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we talked to others, uh, and, and, and they've done the same thing. I don't have time to list them all. It's, it's, it's so good to see when uh, a musician who's made it big can look back and see the same guys in the same town that that they were in that didn't make it big but yeah. still are good musicians yeah. i mean they play their butts off yeah and uh yeah. and can play as good as these guys yeah but it just so happens that someone makes it and, w and when that guy makes it and and just every now and then helps out his buddies from the past he can't be that's that's the way it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so 
we uh, and so now every year we do uh, shows, you know, with with, with uh, uh, a twist. So one year was on Lonnie Mack is from this area, so yeah. we get, all these guitar players came in to help out. And this year we're doing Guitar Fest. Roger Hurricane Wilson comes in from Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I said to Roger, it doesn't pay anything. I mean, it, it's, it's to help the musicians. I'm there, so Roger comes up. Yeah. And uh, and I said to Roger, I said, well, well you know, if it's 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 not Atlanta musicians, it's it's Cincinnati musicians. And Roger said said, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I want to be a part of this because I saw all these great guitar players, and I want to be in there with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's mm -hmm. what we did. Once that's it, but then I have a history with Cincinnati, it's with, with players here, and yeah. you know, and then you know, you and I meet, and and then every time I come through town, you would let me go on the radio with you. I almost felt like I could put it on a resume. <laughs> it's, it's one of your, you know, tag alongs, but it was just a lot of fun. So we just became good friends, and I met a lot of great players, and a couple of. of guys around town that played with me on the road, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Todd Remy was a drummer, that yeah, yeah. real good guy, uh, Jay Scar, who I talked to a little while ago. They were good guys, I mean, I, and, and, and I really appreciate, and I can't tell you how much we appreciate that, because we, we just stay just above water. Yeah. I mean, if somebody puts in, you have to, you have to spend 51, here's a criteria, 51% of what you make in a year, if it comes in, in from music, and music teachers work with us too. Music, then, and you have a claim, then we try to help you out with it. Mm -hmm. And I say, try to help you out with it. It, can, it, it depends on how much money we have. Sure. Because it's going to, mo people are more likely to give to a starving child than they are a musician. And it's just the way it is. And, uh, and that's okay. So we get what we can. And uh, we, we, we save those pennies and we make them into quarters and then dollars and into twenty dollars and then pretty soon we got you know thirty thousand dollars in the bank and somebody all of a sudden says you know I just slammed the car door in my in my hand I can't play for six months we pay his rent for six months sure you know the guy's got a place to live until he gets better and he can help out that's the kind of thing it is it's not we're not going to insure you for life we can't. Yeah, and there's the, that national organization. I met some of the folks out in California for the NAM show with Music Cares. You know, they kind of do the same kind of thing with, with players periodically that, that need help or something like that if mm -hmm. something comes up. Because it, it's tough, you know. I mean, you, you think you're going to play the, you know all the way, but sometimes something steps in the way where you really you really can't, you know. And, you know, as I told you, it came from Larry and Tim Goshorn. Yeah. But it also came from me. I was a musician. I sure. played, I played uh, drummer. And and I played well. You know, sometimes I'm a drummer. I'm bigger. You're a musician. You call yourself a musician. You're a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Uh, but you know, it, 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 I, all of my friends, were, you know, were in the same boat. Uh, many times, like sure. no insurance. W what do we do? And uh, in today's world, you got to have your friends work for you. And if your friends don't, your friends will take care of you. If they're if they're friends. That, that's really cool too of how you would progress from. <coughs> no, I won't say progress, but you move from a, a, an actual musician to a DJ. All those mm -hmm. years as a DJ, and you still look back on you know the musicians and I how they forgotten. they need help. Yeah. Right. I yeah. have not forgotten. I remember what it was like <laughs> on the. Charlie Freeman, the Red Man. He had he had a, a spread in Rolling Stone when he died. He was a great great guitar player. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was like you know we were all it, it's, it's from the same high school in Memphis, Tennessee, Messick High School. C. Cropper, mm -hmm. Duck Dunn, Charlie Freeman, uh, all the other uh, and there are more. B.B. Yeah. Uh, Cunningham. I preach my dear friends. Let it all hang out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And, uh, he, I mean, yeah. I keep looking. Oh, well, he was from our high school. Reggie Young. Reggie Young, uh -huh. the great Reggie Young, yeah. I should say, uh -huh. who played in every session ever played in Nashville, I think. Uh -huh. Reggie uh, was from that high school, a little older than us. Yeah. But <laughs> so many people from that high school, they say half the people from Messick High School in Memphis went into prison, the other half went, <laughs> in, the other half went into music. <laughs> 
Oh yeah. And, I remember uh, that swing we talked about. Let it all hang out. I think I had a, a forty-five copy of that when I was. Oh 14 yeah, BB. Years old. Yeah, that yeah. was the hombres. Yeah. The hombres. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so I was near it forever, and I was like, I had a band in high school, and the band was great. I sucked, but I had the, you know, it was like. You know, I've been so close to it my whole life. I went in. I went in the army. I went to Germany, and uh, I needed something. And uh, Buddy Pearson and the Blues All Stars uh, needed a drummer, and they uh, and I and I lied and said I was one. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> after a, after about two songs, I realized I was not one. <laughs> But I could keep up with them a little bit, you know, and, yeah, and so yeah. I worked really hard to to be able to play better. And, and sure enough, when I by the time I got out of the army yeah. and playing with Buddy and, and and all the guys, I you know it was a it was a Ray Charles type band. Huh. And uh, like if there's a if a, if a fight breaks out and the guy said keep playing, keep playing, we go into Peter Gunn, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> just just to give him a little more fuel. Yeah. It's like Roger was playing. Well, it was a DVD we were watching of his last night, and uh, uh, and a song he goes into in a God of Davia. <laughs> yeah, a there's a fight going to something like that. <laughs> there's a couple of we'll have a song called Broadcast. Um, it's called Talking Heads about the broadcast business being that, that I was in. I wrote a song about that, and just the groove of it toward the end kind of sounds like it, it's got that same feel. Yeah. And so I take about eight bars of in a God of Davia before I end the song. <laughs> yeah. It works out pretty cool. City in the RV, uh, Boomerang City RV with Jimmy Cuz, and we're, and we're headed to the uh, Guitar Fest in Cincinnati. But I'm stopped by here and uh, got a visit from my good friend and uh, Cincinnati radio legend, broadcasting legend, my good buddy Gary Burbank. And we're sitting here telling stories and just having a having a good time. Mention that I'm in the ro in the Radio Hall of Fame. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Oh yeah, be sure to mention that one. Yeah, Radio Hall of Fame. No, I mean, I, really the top of the line right here, man. Yeah, and yeah. A, a great mentor. <laughs> yeah. A, a good friend. And uh, the funny thing was, when I first, you know, we were talking about a mutual friend back at CNN that was my boss and your best friend. And before I knew you, I'd well, heard Len you doing, King. I'd heard you doing, uh, yeah, Len King. I, I'd heard you doing Gilbert Gnarly when I got off the radio in the morning from CNN Radio, long time, in the 80s. And I heard this Gilbert Gnarly voice, which was one of your characters. This dream, and it's a dream about a car. Oh no, it's a red car. And I'm driving through Norwood. Oh no, wait, it's a yellow car, and I, I think it's Newport. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving through Newport, but I'm driving with my dog Crepso. No, Crepso is driving. Oh, this is nice. Wait, why crap so? I'm driving with my lovely wife, Iona. No, it's crap so. Gnarly Motors, built for the confused race. And I loved it, you know, and then I found out who you were, and I, and I remembered your name, and then Lynn and I were friends, and after he left CNN and I left CNN, and we're having breakfast one day, and I, I, didn't, I didn't know that you all were friends. And he says, oh, yeah, my buddy Gary Burbank just left the house. He's headed the floor. I'm going, Gary Burbank, man, that, my hero, you know, because I, I, lo I love the stuff you did. And then you and I became friends and had the music, you know, connection and yeah. interest and all that stuff. And I was a drummer. Yeah, yeah right. And, I, and you, you said something. Not just a drummer. 
No, you, uh, well, I love the uh, Jimmy Reed story, but there's also your Elvis story because you grew up in Memphis, right? I did, yeah. I grew, I grew up in Memphis. We, you got to tell us the Elvis story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a good one. I was about 15 years old. Myself and my best buddy at the time, David Welch. David uh, later on became a professor of. Uh, doesn't matter. Now, if you're a professor, <laughs> professor of, 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 of okay, he was a professor. No, he's a psychologist. But David, David, uh, and I were hitchhiking on. We were about 15 years old, in this black Chevrolet panel truck. It goes past us, and I looked in, and I saw the driver, and I thought, "Damn, that's Elvis." And Dave said, "Are you out of your mind? Why would he be driving that? A black Chevrolet panel truck?" Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. By the way, uh, recently it was sold for a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So let me let me go back. So we didn't think that would really happen, and so we decided to uh, keep it hiking, you know, because he went past us. I went, damn, that was Elvis that went past us. What a jerk! And uh, <laughs> and I loved Elvis. And uh, but then he turned in about two streets up, and I could see him turn in. This is in Memphis, and I can't remember the name of the street, but. Uh, so he turns in, and about five minutes, or maybe three, four minutes later, he comes out about two streets down below us. And I said, David, that's Elvis. He's going to pick us up. So Elvis, sure enough, pulls over, and we run, and I'm running to the, I'm running to the, to the truck thinking, I don't want to ride shotgun. I want to sit next to Elvis. <laughs> I want Nobody to wants middle. shotgun. So and I got there quicker because yeah, I was just faster than Dave. Yeah. And so I jumped in the truck, and Dave jumps in the truck, I looked up, I'm trying to think the whole time about, I gotta say something cool. And the coolest thing I could think of was, you're Elvis, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I had. You know? oh, I meant and he goes, yeah, man, yeah, I know, man. <laughs> we're like, wow. So we told him where we were going, and he said, I'll take you boys there. Because he's just out, you know, gallivanting around okay. in, in his, in his uh, truck that kept him incognito. You said he had furniture in the back. Uh, broken, no, broken furniture in the back. It was, it was all kind of crap, you know. So, so he he like uh, as as we're going, he's gonna take us back to our houses. Uh, one thing, he he saw this girl walking down the street, and uh, he said, to him, "Hey man, watch this." And, and, he, and he and he like hangs his head a little out the window. He goes, "Hey baby," and this girl looks up. And we could see it out of, if you know a panel truck, you got the two little windows out of the yeah. back. We look in the back, she walked right into a telephone pole. <laughs> Bam! And he goes, oh, man, did you see that? We go, That's right, Elvis. And uh, so yeah. we were like, just had the best time. Yeah. So we finally get to my house. Oh, by the way, he, and he's telling us about his movies. He hated his early movies. Yeah, he did. I mean, what, what, what more... Can I? Can, can you say that two people he doesn't know? He's telling the truth. He doesn't like "Love Me Tender." He didn't like any of that crap. He, but I, and I can't remember which movie that he was talking about. He never said the title of it. I think, it, but I think it was King Creole that he thought maybe better than the others he had done. And uh, I think he, I think that was one of the ones he, that I heard that he said he liked. Yeah. 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 And so, so he he liked that. And, uh, but, uh, well, anyway, so he tells us all about that, and, 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 and it's just so cool sitting there with Elvis, like we're just, you know, normally with him. Well, you said he had some, like, in the book, you said he had some furniture in the back, some broken up furniture, and he was going to the dump to dump it out because they'd had a party the night before that and smashed up a bunch of furniture, and you, and you were saying, <laughs> I don't, yeah, you were going, I, what kind of party I, would you have, really, when you smash up a bunch of furniture? <laughs> <laughs> when you smash it? Well, I've had a couple of cents in myself. Yeah, well, yeah, no, <laughs> so now I understand. I, 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 I was only it. 15 years old. I know, I, I, I get it. <laughs> and so, so, Gary, from, from this uh, discussion with Elvis and, and meeting him like that, did, did that inspire you later on to get into the radio and the music world? No, nah, I, I was inspired way before that. Oh, okay, you okay. Know, normally because of my ADHD. <laughs> in, in school, I couldn't, you know, I just, you know, couldn't figure anything out. Elvis ended up, you know, he, he took us to our, our houses and uh, we go to uh, our houses. <laughs> and in my neighborhood, there's usually a thousand kids playing. And here's the problem. 
No kids are outside. None. And I'm like, my God. You know, <laughs> so nobody's going to see no, you with Elvis. And I, so I get out of the truck and I said, thanks, Elvis, <laughs> for the right, Elvis. <laughs> and there's nobody. My mother's not on the porch. Nobody. And, and like, God. So I think they would never believe me. Yeah. And so, and truthfully, you know, they probably shouldn't have, but this time it was true. I'm telling the truth. Yeah. And so, he, then he took David home and I go in my house and nobody believed me, of course. <coughs> and so, um, uh, years later, as I tell the story, he's still on the air all the time. I would tell the story and, uh, and no, and again, no one would believe me that it really happened like that. Yeah. And uh, so I, I uh, decided that what I would do was I would I would like uh, you know get some verification somewhere somehow, and I did find verification within the, the the black Chevrolet panel truck or whatever it was that he drove. Yes, he did. I found that that he did that a lot a lot. You know, yeah. so okay, good. So that's part of it. My wife always said, you know, on the air you tell these stories and you actually start to believe them. <laughs> And, and, and these are things that you didn't happen. I said, no, this did happen. So we had a high school reunion. And David was at the high school reunion. Oh, okay. So there's David across the yeah. floor over there. I said, he let's can verify say, your story. Yeah, let's, let's not say a word about, you know, Elvis picking us up. and Because my wife already said, you dreamed that. You, that's just more bullshit from you. And I'm like, nah. So... David comes over, blah, 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 blah. We talk about 10, 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, David goes, remember that time Elvis picked us up? <laughs> I went, ha, 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 ha. And my wife like, my God, it is a true story. Uh -huh. And I said, yes. And uh, so that verified the whole thing. That really happened. Okay, now, now, l let me take you five years later, maybe 10 years. I forgot exactly how, how long. I was, I was playing drums with a group called the Marquis. And we had a, uh, they had a hit record back uh, in 63, I think, and uh, called Last Night. If you watch the movie Speed, they play it all the way through it. Oh. And uh, so I, I was like, we, we, we had just done a gig. Charlie Freeman was leading the group at that time. And, uh, the Red Man. Uh, Many people know who he. You've heard him a million times playing guitar on on, on records, yeah. and uh, especially if you listen to any, any, any uh, Atlantic stuff. Freeman said, you know that uh, he, he saw. We went by the Memphian Theater back in the old days. There, there were no uh, no way to. If you want to watch a movie, you got to go to a movie theater to see a movie. Well, Elvis would rent the Memphian Theater. And then uh, he, you know, and all of his buddies would come. And I've heard that, yeah. So as we went by, uh, maybe two o'clock in the morning, we see all these Cadillacs and stuff out, out in, in, in front of the Memphian. And Charlie said, hey, that's, uh, that's, that's got to be Elvis's group. We ought to go in and watch the movie. I said, yeah, right. He goes, they might let us go in. Yeah. So we pulled into the parking lot, parked, and we got out, and we were the only one that was in a Cadillac. <laughs> it's just about four of us. Yeah. So we, we go up and said, you know, the guy comes to the door and says, this is a private thing, we can't come in. And he said, well, uh, Charlie said, we're the Marquis, and we just finished a gig somewhere or wherever, and wondered if we could just come in and watch the movie. And the guy said, well, let me, let me go ask Elvis. And so he disappears, comes back pretty quick. Remember that? It was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And he said, Elvis said, yeah, come on in. He likes you guys. Yeah. And so uh, we go in and we sit back. Well, we know our place. We don't go up and say, hey, Elvis, we're here. <laughs> right, you know, right, right. We, we, we sit back in the back. Yeah. And as we're sitting there watching the movie, they're funny. They're talking to Elvis at one point. I remember the only thing I remember is, is Red said something about the movie, and Elvis said, "What are you doing, watching a wall, Red?" You know, and like, uh -huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're like, you know, okay, this, this is cool, you know. Yeah. We're sitting here with Elvis, so I thought, you know, you can go back to the concession stand and get free popcorn and a free coke. I'm doing it. <laughs> so I got up and walked through the little curtain. Remember the old curtains they used to have when you walk back into yeah. the uh, outside, the, uh, not outside, but in, into, into the, the lobby thing, the lobby part. Yeah. So I walked back in the lobby and I, I went over and, I, and there was nobody there. So I got me some popcorn and uh, and I got me a coat. 
And so I'm walking back, and damn, if Elvis doesn't walk through the curtains himself. He walks through the curtains, and he walks right, right past me as I walk past. And I say, hello. And I know better than to go, hey, Elvis, I love you. <laughs> you know, right. so, 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 because I got to be cool, too, because I'm a musician, you know, and I played on, a, you know, with a big group. Huh. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm walking past him, and he, and, and, and I go, how you doing? How you doing? And I got about two steps past him, and I hear, hey! And I turned around, and he goes like, and he looked at me, and he said, how you doing? <laughs> I said, I, I play drums with the Marquis. I like you guys, you're okay. Yeah. Right. He kept looking at me like, you know what I think? And that's what I think. I think he actually recognized, Remember. out of the billions of people that have been in his face, yeah. this kid, yeah, that yeah. only a couple of years before, maybe mm -hmm. maybe three or four years, no more than that, maybe five years before, yeah. had uh, been in his truck. I wow. think he actually recognized me. Yeah, and he goes, he just shook his head, yeah, and I walked on. He walked on, yeah. and that's the rest of the, the story. story. <laughs> well, that's the rest of that story. But there's some, uh, there's a lot of other stories that go along with Gary Burbank. Believe me, uh, you can check him out. You can Google Gary Burbank. Uh, you can check out his book. Also, uh, the video that you saw earlier with Gilbert Nollery, that was from a TV show that uh, Gary did back in 1990 called The Gary Burbank Show. But most of the characters that he did, uh, just about all of them, were all done on radio. And we're going to leave you with a couple here. Uh, one is Earl Pitts, the most famous, uh, kind of a right-wing kind of uh, editorial, uh, comedy editorial. Uh, you should really love it. If you're familiar with Earl Pitts, you'll know what I'm talking about. And another one of his characters that I was partial to, and I think Gary is too, was Reverend Deuteronomy Skaggs. So we're going to leave you with that right here on Boomerosity. Uh, I'm Roger Hurricane Wilson, and we'll see you down the line. And now for news and views of the right wing, here's BBC commentator Earl Pitts, American. You know what makes me sick? You know what makes me so angry? I won't lick a live battery terminal. Me and my old buddy Dub decided to stop in for some chow on the way to the big gun and knife show. So we walk in one of them yuppie butt delis. And the waitress asked us what we want to eat. We said, what else? Bloney sandwiches. Well, she asked, what kind of bread you want on it? And I said, what kind of bread you got? She said, we got rye, dark rye, German rye, rye with curry waste seeds, pumpernickel, crescent rolls, sourdough bread, and something called Peter bread. <laughs> Peter bread? I mean, who on earth's going to eat a bloney sandwich on something called Peter bread? <laughs> I said, ain't you got no Wonder Bread? You can't make a real man sandwich unless you've got Wonder Bread. Bread ain't supposed to look like some sissified French fudge. Real bread looks like drywall with crust. Wake up, America. If Wonder Bread was good enough to mail me a strong beer gut 12 ways, it's good enough to mail me a bloney sandwich in some yuppie deli. This country was built on white bread, and don't you forget it. I'm Earl Pitts, American. Pitts off. Hallelujah. The little TV church of the white wing and gospel truth is on the air. Oh, let's open today with a reading from the book of Hominomines. It's not your Old Testament, not your New Testament, but your present testament writ by me. Now, this is one of my favorite passages, Hominomines 316. And it goeth on us to say it, Yea, verily, though I walk up through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for I am packing a rod. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Even the power, though, of the 357 Magnum cannot put us out of our misery today, flock. And I come today to ease that burden. I'm talking about that biblical relic, the mystery of the ages, the Shroud of Turin. Amen. Yea, flock, but there are skeptics in this world, heathen, miserable, wretched skeptics. And what do they say? They say the Shroud of Turin is a forgery, yea, a hoax, a sham, as phony as Jessica Hans intended. <laughs> and I can't believe it myself, Flock. No, I wanted to see this with mine own eyes, so I called and requested the shroud. 
and, with him. and I took the shroud with my own hands, these hands, and I looked at it with my own eyes, these eyes, and I thought, biblical bamboozle. Did they do that? And at that moment, I knew there was only one thing I could do. That's right, effective today. We're marking down everlasting peace in our shroud of Turin linen sail. <laughs> oh, that's right, twin, full, queen, king, the shroud of Turin linen sail. They may not be authentic. But they are machine washable. Oh, yes. The Shroud of Turin proved to be a proper hoax, a forgery, a forgery, a forgery. A carbon dating test did fail. And that's why we're having this big sale. The test was taken and critics scoffed. But they are still, they are still, they are still 50% off. And I'll see you all during my personal appearance at the Reverend Skaggs Antiquity Clearance. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Don't worry, Flock. When the Shroud of Turin Linen is gone, we'll be getting in a shipment of Shroud of Elvis Linen, authenticated <laughs> by the vacant stage. Oh, don't make me holler. Don't make me shout. Turn them pockets inside out. <laughs> Say me and Flock. Close enough. Yeah. That's good.